I was leaving the supermarket with my children and I saw a man. You've probably seen him yourself. Days old stubble on his chin, lines etched so deep on his face I can tell his age. Fingernails encrusted with dirt and desperate need of attention. In front of him he had an empty coffee cup. In his hands he held a sign. Dad, Dad, what's that man doing? said my six-year-old daughter in that pantomime whisper that all children do so everyone in the vicinity could hear me. <laughs> He's asking for some money, Millie, I said. And she responded with that classic six-year-old answer. Why, Dad? <laughs> because he's hungry, because he hasn't got any food. Why? <laughs> As people walked by, sidestepping, ignoring him, she pulled down my hands. Dad, Dad, why is not giving him any food? Why is not giving him any money? She looked at me. She pulled down my hand and said, Dad, can we go and give him some money? Children are born naturally kind, but somewhere between the age of six and 45, it just gets leached away. Perhaps, as Viktor Frankl said, we are so exposed to suffering that we become inured to it. We see illness, deprivation every day, and we ignore it because that's part of our defense mechanism, part of the armor we wear. There used to be an evolutionary benefit to being kind. It was the whole reason the word kind is derived from the word kin, from kinness. We wanted to be like <laughs> each other. But survival of the fittest has faded away, and now we're going for something else. As the great man Charles Darwin actually said in his blockbuster sequel to Origin of the Species, sympathy will be increased through natural selection in those populations and those groups which have the most sympathetic number of members. It's time for the unselfish gene to foment itself. Now we've grown away from our African tribal origins. Our tribes now look a little different. They're the people we work with every day. This is the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. They're the people we contact, we communicate with, people we make connections with, either in reality or in the virtual. And sometimes those words mailed like they do today. You might recognize a couple of people on this slide. Well, that's all well and good, but what's the point of being kind? Obviously, it's, you know, the receiver will get something out of it, but what about you, the giver? We know that being kind increases your lifespan. Being kind increases your empathy. It makes you happy no matter what mood you're in. And it also makes the life you lead more meaningful. Now, I want to be clear, I'm talking about being kind, and a lot of people have been talking about, oh, why don't you just be nice? I want to be a nice man. This is a lovely nice man here. He's, you know, he pays his rent on time, no complaints from the neighbours, actually works in a chocolate factory and brings home free samples to the next door neighbours. Unfortunately, Jeffrey Dahmer did kill and mutilate 17 people and then he ate them. This is not a kind man. <laughs> Nicety is a societal construct designed to give power to people. I want you to be kind people, not nice people. So, it's easy to see why we should be kind, but how can we do it? You may feel there's absolutely no point. You're just a small cog in the big healthcare machine. You can't make any difference at all. But because of one six-year-old girl, a homeless man was fed for a week. You can make a difference. You don't need to make a difference to everyone. You just need to make a difference to one person. So how can you do that? I think I wanted to bring us all back to childhood as a way of reminding yourself, and we've heard about airway, breathing, circulation, and ABCs. And I don't want to do that. I'm going to do something that all Victorian school children know. I want you to stop, look, listen, and think. Mm -hmm. So in our sort of WhatsApp world of always on push notifications, I'm constantly interrupted at work. I get ECGs thrust into my face every five minutes. I get two nursing staff and an intern asking me to make decisions about patients. I think I'm pretty good at multitasking until I started writing this talk with Twitter open in the browser window in the corner and realized my attention constantly get pulled away. Multitasking is a myth and really we owe it to our patients to actually stop, be in the moment with them, sit down and have a conversation. We want to display a degree of mindfulness in the way that John Kabat-Zinn would have it, being present in the moment and without judgment. Once we've stopped, it's so our time to actually look at our patients. In 200 microseconds of looking at someone, we've made a judgment call. We've decided whether they're trustworthy, whether we believe what they're going to say, and believe it or not, our patients are making the same decisions when they look at us. 
Our doctors were actually really rubbish at looking at our patients. So back in the late 80s, Pollock and L videoed 450-odd oncologists having discussions with their patients. In 22% of cases, the oncologists missed these subtle, non-verbal cues that they're trying to give information across. It was those chewing of fingernails, pulling at hair, arms rubs, and because the oncologists weren't even looking at their patients, they were consulting the notes, they were consulting the computer screen in front of them. They missed these cues for empathy and connection. It's important that you do look at your patients. And once you've looked at them, you actually want to listen to what they're going to say. Now we know, I'm sure most people have read, that doctors interrupt their patients within 18 seconds of them starting to talk. And that's no matter what speciality they're in. How much information are we missing out because of that? It's very easy to think that we're going to do drill down close communication techniques, asking very strict questions. Are we going to get through many more patients in a shift? By not letting our patients talk out their piece. What happens is they don't give us the information we want. When we start asking more and more questions, they get more and more fed up with us and they don't trust us. We don't get the information we need. We don't make that connection with our patients. And when we do get the, give them a chance to speak, we may ask them questions. But then what do we do? We leap straight in, trying to give them their answers. So how long should we wait? So if it's a simple yes, no question, three seconds is what the educationists would say, just wait three seconds for an answer. But if it's something more complicated, there is no time limit to what you're saying. You need to get comfortable sitting in that silence, watching the tumbleweeds blow by, preparing to actively listen to what they're going to say. And so what does that mean? That means actually listening to what they're saying, not thinking about what you're going to say next. It means asking clarifying terms. So, how did that make you feel? Uh-huh, yeah, then what happened? These are the ways we make connection with other human beings. And then, when the consultation's finished and they stop speaking, is there anything else? Is there anything else you'd like to tell me? So hopefully, these are the things that work talking to our patients. But more importantly, they actually work talking to your wife when you're not having an argument with them. Those are the life skills that I'm going to teach you today. So we've stopped. We've sat in with a patient. We've looked at them. We're listening to what they say. But now it's the hardest thing to do. I want you to think. Patients generally do not want to be in hospital. For all of our patients, the day that we see them is probably the most important day of their year. Perhaps even their lives. Certainly it's often the most stressful. And we forget that. For us, that fourth woman of the day with early pregnancy bleeding is an ultrasound and a blood test and here you go, go away. That woman has a name. She has hopes and dreams attached to that miscarriage. How would you like your relatives or loved ones to be treated? And it's really easy if we like patients and they're like us. But what about those harder patients? What about those drug addicts, the homeless, the morbidly obese, the mentally unwell? Don't they deserve our kindness too? Don't they deserve some degree of human connection? So I've talked a little bit about the importance of being kind. How making that empathic connection is going to make our life or work easier and how it's going to make us live a little longer. I've spoken a little bit about how you can do it. How you should stop. Be in the moment. You can look your patients rather than at the notes. You can listen to what they have to say and actually think. But really it's time for that interaction, isn't it? What's the point of me giving you these ideas and you do nothing and just leave them here? So some of you today you may have noticed there are some envelopes lurking around. If you've got an envelope, can you hold it up in the air, please? If there's empty envelopes that no one has, just steal it, just grab it. <laughs> okay, all those of you an envelope, stand up, please. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to open them, but I think you want to know what's inside, don't you, really? It's a little present from me to you. There's a reminder of why we're here today. But there's also a gift inside, but that gift isn't for you. That gift <laughs> is for someone else. Who you choose to give that gift to is entirely up to you. I don't mind. 
It's all up to us to increase our human connection. Kindness is something that we can all share. Don't forget to be kind. Open up your place. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>